Good afternoon. My name is Gary Chow, and I'm that guy. Uh, so my name is Gary Chow, and uh, along with my partners, Christina Shi and Leland Reckes, I, I co-teach a, a course called Entrepreneurial Design, um, which the students take in the first year of the program. Um, and um, the course is kind of like a reality TV game show where we present a set of challenges that the students have to complete out in the real world. For example, they have to post something on Twitter and get at least 20 retweets, and that's intended to help them understand how networks like Twitter work. Uh, they also have to identify someone they would like to meet and get a warm introduction to that person, you know, which is intended to help them learn how to activate their existing networks to get what they want. The goal of all of this is to help them learn to leverage networks. And it's because we have this fundamental belief that today, uh, the long-term success of a designer is no longer just a function of the quality of their work, but of the size and quality of their network. And in a world of networks, learning to leverage them is just as important a skill as learning how to prototype your ideas. The main challenge of the course is to launch a project that generates $1,000 using the internet, but with a few rules. It should be legal, you can't rent your bedroom out, and you can't perform time-based labor, so no consulting because that would be too comfortable for a designer to do. Uh, instead, you have to make something, put your name on it, and launch it out into the world, and that could be daunting. Not all of the students make $1,000, but the money is really not the goal of the exercise. In the context of a design program, the project teaches students that their ideas exist not in a vacuum, but alongside many real-world constraints many of which are unpredictable, and most of which are outside of a designer's control. And this is important to experience in the safety of a classroom because it is really hard. Negotiating the ambition of our ideas with the reality of our constraints requires a heightened level of honesty with ourselves, our process, and our work. And the challenge with reality is that we may not like what it has to say. And so learning to respect it takes some time and it takes practice. As an instructor, it's an incredibly fun course to teach uh, because none of us really knows what is actually going to happen. Um, as instructors, we're not there to judge the student. We're there to coach and to cheer them on. We're riding alongside them wherever they may go. And so I can't say enough what an honor it is to be here today to see where you all have landed one year later and to have an opportunity to have an audience with you as you all move on. For the record, I will say that this has been a very challenging talk for me to write. Um, on the one hand, I feel like there's so much uh, that I could say. Um, on the other hand, I feel like you've already heard all of my best analogies and words of wisdom. <laughs> I kind of have nothing left to give. You know, or for that, we have articles on Medium. So. Since we do have this time together, I thought that maybe um, I should just catch you up on me. <laughs> it's, cl <laughs> it's clear you've all had a busy year managing your final projects alongside figuring out what you want to do. Um, I've been busy too. Uh, I turned 40 this past year, so naturally it's been a very reflective one for me. Um, I celebrated by throwing a breakfast taco party. Many of you came, thank you. This has also been my first year of operating Orbital, which is a space in the Lower East Side dedicated to helping people launch their own projects. Thanks to many of you and the alumni, it's stayed afloat and is chugging along. So what I'd like to talk about is why I did it and how that has changed in this past year. One of the ideas we've talked about in class is that there's this macro level shift underway from bureaucratic incumbent hierarchies to a world of networks. And for the, my students, you've, you've heard me use those words very, very often. So a lot of good things, I think, come about as a result. You know, networks enable information and ideas to flow more freely around gatekeepers, giving individuals greater access to information as well as to each other's narratives. Networks tend towards transparency, challenging businesses that live off of asymmetric, oh, sorry, live off of asymmetries of information 
another big word, or command and control models. And we think about this mostly in the context of business. You know, as an employee, we may discover other companies that are more aligned with our interests and values, so we may be more likely to join them versus stay at a place where we are unhappy, and we can do that. Or we, or we may discover people who are living a life pursuing their own interests altogether, and that may inspire us to follow a similar path, one which we had not seen before. Mm. The significance of this shift goes beyond businesses too. We've become more acutely aware of the existing injustices going on in the world in real time, internationally, instantaneously, as well as here in Ferguson, New York, and Baltimore. Networks allow us to inform people, to organize, to support each other in ways that we couldn't do before. And all of these things, I think, are fundamentally good. At the time that I created Orbital, I looked at this shift to a network world as a shift of power to individuals. And so, you know, at the time, I would best describe my goal to be one of cultivating a community of independent creators, all of whom are trying to leverage these networks for their own purposes. Over time, that has shifted slightly, and it's because the landscape has evolved. I think what we see now is that most successful networks exhibit winner-take-all economics. One player emerges from the pack and captures a disproportionately large share of the rewards. As the network grows, it serves more individuals, but the network itself becomes more powerful. That would not be such a bad thing by itself, but when you consider both the architecture and the governance model of these networks, you realize that what you are really looking at are these really highly centralized systems where power sits squarely with the company, which itself has a dual class share structure where such that the voting power resides solely in the hands of the founder. And I don't really think there's much you can really do about it. You know, it already, it already exists in that in itself is neither good nor bad. But what I kind of pause at is this idea that these centralized networks are gonna be around for a while, mm. quite a long time, perhaps longer than the incumbents that they themselves replaced. So I start to worry a bit about how the shift affects the distribution and balance of power in our society. And as that has broadened the scope of the problem that I'm thinking about, from just cultivating a community of creators to thinking about how to create new power structures that are more aligned with the interests of the constituents, with, the, with its constituents, um, you know, I think about that problem as well as how that such efforts could be sustained. And so this is why I am doing what I'm doing. And it is a weird thing to try to describe to people because there are no labels that exist that fully define what it is that I'm trying to do. And also, there's part of me that doesn't really quite understand what it's going to become. And part of the journey is to try to uncover that and see what we discover. Mm. But that is my journey, and it is not yours. And this is still a graduation keynote. So in that vein, I'd like to share with you some thoughts that I think may be helpful as you go on in your respective journeys not just thoughts about design, but thoughts that would have helped me in my career over the past 20 years, and specifically thoughts that I don't think we have talked about before in class. First, don't be in such a rush or worry that your short-term decisions will mark you forever. Have a long-term time frame. Most of my career is best described as opportunistic wandering. And truthfully, it's only been in the last five years of my life that I've been able to make sense of the decisions that I made when I was in my 20s and early 30s. If you don't know what it is you want to do, don't worry about it. And don't feel like you need to have an answer for everything. People will like you more as a result. Besides, you make your path by walking. Instead, I'd suggest a more pragmatic alternative. Make as much money as you can, as long as what you do sits within your morals. It may someday enable you to bear the risk of leasing an old tenement building or something else. Money doesn't buy you time, but it does provide more optionality. Then, use your time to do other things that introduce you to people and stories outside of your workplace. As you navigate your career, be cognizant of the vessel in which you choose to travel. Be mindful that we inherit so much, not just from who we spend our time with, but from the structures in which we sit. 
the design of these structures affect how we behave and how we feel. And so if you find yourself in an overly homogenous environment, obsessing about salary, recognition, and the place in which you sit within that hierarchy, or if you find yourself no longer aligned with the values and belief systems that govern your work or the people for whom you create that work, it may be time to find another vessel, or it may be time for you to create your own. Our emotional energy is finite. If you make decisions or behave in a way that incurs emotional debt, at some point you will have to pay it up and that could cost you years of your life as well. Community comes from trust. Trust comes from dialogue. Dialogue is best face to face. Never stop learning. Teaching is the best way to learn. Sometimes life presents you with a problem that you were not meant to solve. If this happens to you, quit as fast as you can the moment you realize it. Finally, I'd like to reclaim the word thesis. <laughs> Have a thesis for how you want to spend the heartbeats of your life. It may take a lifetime to find out what it is we need to say, and that is okay. The thesis that has been most impactful for me is one that my friend Karen Chen, an independent film producer, has. She refers to it instead as, has, as, as having a philosophy of producing. She says, it's not just the stories that we choose to tell, but it's how we work with the people, who we choose to work with, what communities we choose to build. That has echoed in my mind constantly over the past few years, um, before Orbital, as, as I was trying to figure out my next steps. And I think about it almost every day when I'm making decisions at Orbital, teaching here in the department, engaging with my colleagues on the faculty, and when I think about the work that I want to create. For me, at this point in my life, it is all about the stories we choose to tell, who we choose to work with, how we, cho how we work with the people in which we serve, and what communities we choose to build. But you can find your own thesis, and that is the challenge that I present to all of you. I don't believe you could have made a better decision with respect to how you've spent the past two years of your lives. You came in as individuals and you've left with a network. You've spent two years building trust amongst yourselves and the faculty and now with the alumni. This network is one of the vessels that you have that you can turn to as you pursue your own paths and figure out the thesis of your own lives. And I encourage you to use it as much as you can and I also say this from experience. Being part of this program and this network has been life-changing for me. Orbital would not exist if it weren't for the privilege of teaching here. It is supported and sustained by many alumni of this program. It is inspired by not just all of you, but classes that have come before. And it's, you know, it's undoubtable. It's, it's hard for me to, imagine what I would be doing without teaching here. You know, I, it's, it's funny, today is, uh, I, I have a different view of this day in some ways, not to make it all about me, um, but I was going through my email um, over the weekend and I discovered that actually it was exactly four years ago today on this day that my friend John Colco introduced me to Liz. And so for that I'm very thankful to John Liz, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to have taught in this program. And, you know, the last thing I will say is, you know, I've benefited from working with you all. And for that, I will always be grateful. Thank you. <laughs>